Star Wars Rebels is back. The season three premiere was a solid episode that will probably be best remembered for the very first canon appearance of everyone's favorite Chiss Grand Admiral. But there were plenty of other moments to discuss, Easter eggs to find, and references newer fans may have missed, so we'll be talking about all that and more in this video. Let's go ahead and talk about Thrawn first. He was very sparingly used in this episode, which surprised me. He's clearly pulling the strings behind the scenes, and he's got the Rebels under his thumb, even if they don't know it yet. I would say his introduction to the show is very true to his character in Timothy Zahn's books. He immediately makes a connection between two seemingly unrelated Rebel appearances. He sees things that other Imperials do not. The larger picture. His Sherlock Holmes-like abilities of connecting the dots and anticipating his enemy's moves was one of his most defining characteristics in Legends. We also learn his promotion to Grand Admiral was very recent. He earned the rank after he commanded the Battle of Batome, which saw high civilian casualties, but also the destruction of the rebels there. It's interesting to note that Callus is the Imperial to point out the civilian deaths. That could be further foreshadowing his defection, as some fans have theorized. I would be very surprised if we don't see the Battle of Batome itself in the upcoming Thrawn book. Timothy Zahn has stated that the story will take place over a long period of time, ending shortly before this episode. I expect we'll see Thrawn's entire military career in the Empire and his rise to Grand Admiral. Assuming I'm right, I just want to express my appreciation to the story group for taking the time to connect what we're seeing now in September to a book that won't be released until April. But back to the episode. Thrawn anticipates and sabotages a rebel plan to steal some Clone Wars era Y-Wings. His plan is to draw out the enemy fleet and destroy them. He proves his patience when only the small cell that we're familiar with takes the bait, and he lets them go. He sacrifices a small victory for a larger one down the road. Okay, as giddy as I am about Thrawn's return, there is so much more to talk about, so I'll just say that so far, this adaptation of his Legends character is very satisfying. Part of me wishes he were more present this episode, but I'll take it as a good sign that I was left wanting more. Let's move on to our actual main characters and what they're all up to. The main focus of this episode was Ezra, and they made it very apparent how much darker he's become. Season 2 definitely upped the ante on darkness, showing our heroes on the ropes and struggling to survive against the Inquisitors, Vader, and the dark side in general. This time around, it's our heroes responsible for the show's tone. I don't have any hard facts here, but I wouldn't be surprised if this episode had the largest human-on-human -human kill count. Ezra alone killed at least 16 stormtroopers. He killed one within the first minute. And the ATDP mind control scene? Wow, that's messed up. I really enjoyed seeing Zeb and Sabine's hesitant support of Ezra and his methods, but they definitely know something's going on. One small thing I noticed was Zeb telling Hera Ezra's mind trick was wizard. I found that to be an out-of-the-character thing for him to say, and it makes me wonder if Wizard is actually a secret way of telling Hera about Ezra's disturbing behavior. But it's probably far more likely that I'm simply overanalyzing that one moment. Ezra's hot-headed determination to complete his missions begin alienating his friends, and by the end of the episode puts them in mortal danger. And he gets the Phantom destroyed, which I was shockingly upset about. I do want to say that I like the way Rex is handling Ezra. He's very fatherly supportive of his decisions, and encouraging when things don't go as planned. I can see this relationship going one of three ways. One, Ezra actually listens to the advice of his friends and mellows out, but that seems unlikely. Two, Ezra continues to push the envelope until all of his friends stop trusting him, including Rex. Or three, and this is the one I'm terrified about, Ezra gets Rex killed. That would be heartbreaking, but would also be a massive wake-up call. I do think Ezra saw the consequences of his actions to a degree in this episode, but this storyline is far from over. His rash behavior can be attributed to two things, the holocron and the absence of Kanan. After his blindness, Kanan has grown distant from the rest of the crew. Lacking a teacher, 
Ezra has turned to the Sith Holocron for new knowledge and power. We still don't know who is in the Holocron, but hopefully that will soon be revealed. I'm relieved Kanan found it in the first episode. I did not want them to drag out that confrontation. Kanan's own journey included the call of the mysterious force being known as the Bindu. I've gotta say, I find it a little convenient that this planet happens to be the home of a powerful and wise creature that can help Kanan find his way. So, until I'm told otherwise, I'm gonna operate under the assumption that the creature we see isn't the Bindu's true form. I'm guessing it's the form we see because it fits in well with the landscape, but maybe he has the ability to travel anywhere and take on any form. In fact, the owl creatures, called Convor, make multiple appearances on the way to and with the Bindu. Maybe he can see through them and control them. Maybe the Convor we saw on Malachor will be revealed as the Bindu, guiding Ahsoka on whatever journey she's currently undergoing. I just hope there's some explanation that rationalizes the Bindu's sudden appearance on this planet. Anyway, the Bindu helps Kanan reconnect with the Force and gain back some of his confidence. After leaving the Holocron in the hands of this brand new acquaintance, which may or may not be a terrible idea, Kanan returns to his friends and begins rebuilding his bond with Ezra. The Rebels do successfully capture some Y-Wings, but I'm a little confused as to what their fate will be. Commander Sato mentions building a strike force to bomb the Empire's factories on Lothal, but Hera says the Y-Wings are meant for General Dodonna, which makes sense considering his unit has Y-Wings at the Battle of Yavin. Maybe both units will work together to bomb Lothal, and that will be the setting for the larger trap set by Grand Admiral Thrawn. Those are all the major talking points about the premiere. I think it was a really solid episode, although I didn't think it was as strong of an opener as Season 2's premiere. But, I mean, come on. It's hard to compete with Vader, and I'm glad the show isn't afraid to try new things. Before I sign off, I just want to run through some of the Easter eggs and smaller references I picked up on. Since I just mentioned him, the General Dodonna name drop was a nice touch. If you don't know the name, it's the guy who gave the briefing on the Death Star before the Battle of Yavin. Ezra has a couple of fun posters on his wall. One reads Corellian YT-1300. Another is of Ben Quadraneros, and what I can make out says Classic Pod Racer inside. Maybe it was a cereal box and Quadraneros was like a little toy or action figure inside. But the magazine or comic book or whatever this is on his desk is my favorite one. It reads Space Wars. Chopper seems resistant to piloting Y-Wings. We know Hera repaired him after finding him in a crashed Y-Wing on Ryloth. Maybe Chopper has PTSD. The Bindu refers to the Ashla and the Bogan, which were ancient legends terms for the light and dark sides of the Force. The predecessors of the Jedi Order sought to seek balance between the two, much like the Bindu is the self-proclaimed one in the middle. Also, the name Bindu is a reference to the original name for the Jedi Knights in early drafts of the scripts, the Jedi Bindu. The Mining Guild TIE Fighters from Season 2 are back, as is Titus, the Imperial that used to be in charge of the Interdictor Cruiser from Season 2. Grand Moff Tarkin's office is shown to have a Venator-class Star Destroyer as decoration. I thought that was a great nod to Tarkin's past. Also, Governor Price refers to him twice as Moff Tarkin, and I found that very odd. He's definitely a Grand Moff at this point, and was even referred to as Grand Moff in Season 1. I just find it strange that Price doesn't call him by his full title. Hondo is back, and by the end of the episode, he's got an Imperial shuttle and a crew of Ugnaughts. I can't even begin to imagine the kind of trouble he'll get into. Man, we covered a lot here. What did you guys think of the episode? Are you as excited for Thrawn as I am? What do you think about the Bindu? Did I miss any Easter eggs? Let's talk about the episode in the comments, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to see videos just like this, breaking down every episode of Rebels. Also, like this video, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and consider checking out my Patreon page. As always, thank you for watching, and may the Force be with you.